Good afternoon slash scorching summer evening, everyone. Uh, this is, I think, you know, quite a, a special talk for me. I've done a few of these, moderating, you know, friends and artists and patrons here at our Basel, uh, where I also work. But I, this is the first real kind of in-depth in conversation, one-on-one um, -on -one with an artist who I admire greatly, Aparna who is sitting here to my left. And it's also has been an interesting experience to see really how Aparna, I think her you know, commitment to her work is also very much a commitment to her life and her practice and real dedication. And I think we have a, a little mutual admiration club for each other, so I, uh, I, I have to say that it has been a real pleasure um, first time I've ever had a talk where the artist has given me notes to, uh, to, to go over, and I really appreciate it, actually. So I guess I want to say, you know, Aparna is uh, originally Indian and uh, an incredible one half of the team of Porce and Rao. Uh, and India is a country that I'm half Libyan, half American, and my mother says to me that my love of India is very much like her love of the Middle East when uh, she was you know, a student leaving Minnesota and kind of fell in love with the Middle East. I have fallen in love with India. And Aparna now is living in Zurich, and her laboratory is in Zurich, but the studio is in India. So I think, you know, first of all, maybe tell us about, you know, since we're here in Basel, in Switzerland, tell us about your lab in Zurich and how that happened and why that is. Yeah, thanks, Alia, for the very generous introduction. Yeah, I'm really delighted with the lab. It's new. We started off in March, so it's only been three months. And it's under the umbrella of the Wies Institute, which is also new, and it's affiliated with ETH and the University of Zurich with the idea of sort of translating good and useful technologies in the area of robotics and degenerative medicine into the public domain. But you're not a scientist. So how, how did that happen? Yeah, actually, I don't know, because we've been really working with this field of animatronics, and uh, we don't have a technical background at all. So we're really interested in sort of um, these lifelike expressions, especially the involuntary expressions of the body and those that somehow kind of reveal our complex inner states. And not actually having a technical background, we couldn't really perceive the limitations in technology. So when we started to animate things, it was really quite baffling how difficult it was to move an object even in a simple way. And so we started to devise our own sort of methodologies and processes for animating. And you know, all of robotics, they're very concerned about efficiency and precision and functionality. And so robots are very good at going from A to B, but we're very interested in the ways in which it moves from A to B, because we feel like there's a very rich language embedded and all these signals and intuitive communication that happens. And that's kind of an underexplored area in robotics. Mm -hmm. And so our approach to robotics has been quite different from academia or mainstream robotics, and that's somehow interesting. Then how does that interplay with the idea of, I know you also work with an animation, and this idea of 2D, 3D, physical, screen. I mean, how do you balance that? Yeah, we work only with 3D animation, so, I mean, sorry, with physical animation. And physical animation is about uh, animating physical objects. So 3D animation means computer animation and 2D screen animation. That's already very rich and sophisticated, and there's really a limitless possibility. We already see all, uh, you know, various possibilities and personal signatures and cultural styles. We have Miyazaki and Disney, and we have the Eastern European traditions and manga, but and you can animate any object on screen and give it complex qualities and build in satire and humor and irony. But in the physical world, we're still quite far from being able to move an object in a way that it can reflect a consciousness. And that's something we're very interested in doing. And that means kind of going against the grain of what's happening in robotics right now. And Maybe can you show us? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so can I have so we a can actually see what we're, what we're talking about here. Yeah, so this work is called Frame Runners, and it was actually the first time that we started a collaboration in Switzerland with ETH Zurich, specifically with the Autonomous Systems Lab from where some early drones came. And it was also really exciting to be in this context because they are also preoccupied with mimicking biological forms of locomotion. 
So the idea of this work, uh, we were inspired actually by a real window in our studio. And it was to kind of create this grid-like structure. And we wanted it to be inhabited by these small creatures that are represented by these semicircles. And the idea was that these creatures would be able to run backward and forward and be able to hide in between the walls. But the way that we wanted them to move was in this kind of happy-go-lucky way, like they were skipping along and they were quite lighthearted. Until, of course, they kind of uh, have a stimulus of movement from the external world, and they will suddenly feel threatened and then immediately hide and disappear. So we thought this would be rather simple to do, but it wasn't that trivial. And there was a master's student thesis involved. And that, that's why, because I noticed with the dating of the work, it says 2009 to present. So maybe yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's have a little discussion about that also. Yeah, I mean, that's slightly depressing if you want to have an exciting artistic career. But yeah, <laughs> that's how long it takes to develop these kinds of things. Because uh, I think it's also us not really knowing about technology and venturing down a path that we wouldn't realize would end up being so difficult. And also finding people that are excited about these kinds of things. It's getting easier now, but in general, the technical production is really long. It involves a lot of failure and burning our fingers often. So about that, I mean, the idea of the people who you're working with, I mean, they are also people who are very, you know, kind of probably working in more technical aspects of their professions rather than, frankly, working with like crazy artists who are asking them to do animation or asking them to be involved in robotics. So how do you find those people? How, how does that all come about? And really also, you just mentioned a lot of failure. How do you, how do you kind of emotionally, physically handle that? I mean, that's really difficult, to be honest, because it's, uh, we now have this lab at ETH, but it's built on 14 years of mostly failing. And um, yeah, so yes, we, that's the most painful part of this work, because you fail so much, and it affects your life in a really drastic way. But I think the only way to get over it is to get through it, and so we never give up. And it's, it's also kind of strange that your life is affected by just making artworks. It's not like we're saving the planet or humanity. So you have to kind of reconcile with that as well. Yeah, I disagree. I think that if the people who are in these two, three halls were the ones running the world, we would all be in a much better place right now than we are. So, um, it's, so that how and, and the people you work with, how do you? How do you find them? Like, how are those conversations created? I mean, we've, we've been lucky, and we've also kind of worked with a lot of engineers so far. And, and you uh, didn't study no, science no. or engineering no, in any way? we don't have a technical background at all. So our background is more in graphic design and drawing and illustration and that sort of thing. So it's just our personal interest that has brought us to physical animation. Mm -hmm. So now we have, we're really working with the best of the best. And so it's really much easier and it's easier to communicate. And you know, we've also had to develop our own methodologies and processes to be able to engage with engineers. And we have that worked out quite well by now. Mm -hmm. And we also have a different sort of entrance to technology. We don't have a theoretical in, uh, you know, entrance, but our intuition with technology is quite high because it, it's affected us so much that we are usually kind of in sync about which direction we can go and where we think we're going to fail. We're usually quite right. And so and you work with several institutions. I mean, obviously, this work had been developed at e, uh, ETH in, in Zurich, right. but you work throughout Switzerland now yes. and, and elsewhere. Yes, yeah. So I'll just finish this, and I'll show you two other projects where we worked with different institutions. So this work was, we started in 2009, and it was with ETH before we had our lab. So let me just quickly show you the prototype that we received from ETH. So you see, it's actually, we're just animating a circle, but you can um, kind of see all these ephemeral qualities that I spoke about. And it's only because we are working with a very, very specific motion curve. And I want to say here that this kind of illusion of life only happens when you work in that level of precision. And so before we got this right, the head was kind of bouncing up a lot more than it was moving forward. And it looked like a bouncing ball. There was nothing alive about it. And when you go back and change all the gear ratios, that inanimate bouncing ball can suddenly become a creature or a human with all these qualities. So I'll just quickly show you. Um, 
some of the runners that were testing in the studio. And so the uh, whole idea is to have a kind of very alive feel in the way that they move and express themselves. The next work that I want to show you is actually produced in our lab. So it's very new, and it's a work that we finished in three months, which is kind of a miracle. And it's the idea of a closed box. And there's an A4 sheet of paper, which is kind of mechanically enacting a very specific gust of wind that we experienced in our studio in Bangalore. So, so only this work is actually on show here um, at Gallery Ske in, uh, in our Basel along with another work that Yes, which we'll I'm going see. to show as yeah. well, yeah. And so um, it's a gust of wind, which is mechanically actuated. And it's the exact same gust of wind that will keep repeating uh, with a randomized pause of between 5 and 15 seconds. This is Alia, the other work that I told you about with another collaboration that we have with a really amazing technical institute near Sangalan called NTB Books. And the idea was, again, to develop a kind of a creature. Wait for this. You have to pay attention. This is like one of my favorites. <laughs> and so it's the idea of a small cube that stands in the center of the room. And as viewers approach it, it will literally flare up into four times its volume and twice its height by swallowing the space between its core that it's trying to protect and the space between the viewer, as if it feels threatened and wants to intimidate the viewers and keep them away. We were also very interested in sort of... How does it sense the view? Like, what's... Yeah, that's a real easy part. You can do that with cameras or PR sensors or anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The hard part is the safety, because it has to move at one meter per second. And even if we manage to get there, you can kill somebody. So you have to be careful about that. Um, so yeah, at the small size, we really wanted a regular cube. And at the big size, we wanted this sort of scaling effect and a visual complexity that would sort of hint to a secrecy. So this work is in the eighth year of development. It's also supported by the Art Affiliate Foundation that's here. And um, the, um, it's in the fifth stage of uh, sort of reiteration. I just want to show you this slide where you can see the scale of the work. So that's from the smallest size to the largest size. We haven't, at this point, didn't have the courage yet to mechanically actuate it. But that's what we need to do. So at this moment, it's still a very beautiful machine that was possible because we worked with these amazing engineers. But we're still we just not... just show that maybe one more time? So Yeah, sure. Yeah, so this is at 1.2 meters high. So that's much smaller than human scale. And the idea was to grow to 2.16 meters, which is much bigger than human scale. And so at this point, we still don't know if it's going to make it to an artwork, because we still have to move it in that very narrow organic band where it needs to achieve all these speeds and have these motion curves and behaviors. But it finally looks like we're going to have an artwork by the end of the year. So we can't wait to see it. The technicians and the artists, uh, the technicians and uh, scientists that are working on this with you, do they understand the difference between the technical aspect and making an artwork, as you just say? Or, yeah, I mean, these people are pretty special. There are just a few of them, and we've managed to now connect with these engineers after burning our fingers at least six times so far. So um, yeah, I think if anybody can do it, it's them. And so we're quite fortunate to be here. So you were saying what what work, you know, was perhaps maybe the easiest for you to realize? I think it was the gust of wind. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also because we have this lab and we have an amazing systems lead engineer, Dr. Philip Reist. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are on the same wavelength. And he was able to make this uh, motion interface that allowed us to put technology completely in the background. And so we could intuitively make these motion curves that would normally take many, many months to kind of code and look at the curve and so on. Mm -hmm. And so one of the main aims of our lab is to literally eliminate the engineer and eliminate technology, because it's only when technology becomes invisible that something can become alive. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a counterintuitive process. Well, and especially I encourage everyone in the audience um, and whoever is going to be watching us online, hi, hopefully you get to see the work one day. Um, but to even just look at it from the side and to look at it, you know, in a very technical aspect, the ways in which it moves and that it, it's your idea of involuntary movement is very central to your practice and to your work. 
Yes, because I think Sora and I are both very interested in these sort of uh, behavioral patterns and the way they're expressed physically in the body. And we also share these movements with other creatures, you know, responses to stimuli. And I can introduce another work right after this, which is where we worked with the idea of beings for the first time. And mm. it was a sort of exploration of the primal reflex to duck or hide when you sense danger in the environment. And it's also sort of pointing in the direction of the certain fragile phenomenon which occur under special conditions, in this case, in silence. So let me just quickly show you that work. This is the, the other work that's actually at the fair in a very small form. Um, yeah, and so the idea was to sort of feel surrounded by a tribe of very shy, sensitive, and mischievous creatures that we affectionately call the pygmies. And so we have these 26 panels which are camouflaged around three walls of a room. And behind them uh, hide over 300 of these small little creatures. So they're afraid of sound. So when the environment is quiet, they will peep out. And if there's still no noise, they will strain their necks out. And at the slightest sound, they will hide again. So let me quickly show you this slide. Uh, Yeah, so we took the lifelike organic aspects very seriously. Hey. Hey. So they also hear like real creatures, they will become <clears throat> immune to repeating sounds, go into shock behavior. And each of these creatures is sort of self-generating their own movement in real time in response to real stimuli. So yeah, this, uh, this was also a very challenging work because we again had to hit that band of life by combining a very slow speed with a very quick retraction in a very small space and making no sound. But it was really exciting, uh, you know, this idea of sharing how our brains are hardwired to read motion as, living for, as a living motion. So just when we'd finished this work in our studio, we had somebody visit, and they weren't aware of what this work was, and the pygmies were hiding. And from the corner of their, their eye, they sort of saw one pop up, and they jumped out of their skin. And at the same time, our studio cats noticed and started to hunt them down, whereas all the rest of the time, they were just sort of lazing around. So yeah, we can we pick up movement and immediately associate it with life. But so that idea of interacting with the viewer, I mean, you know, even, you know, these works are very responsive to who is seeing them. And, and how, I mean, is that something, do you think of individuals or, I mean, how, how do you kind of translate that in, into creating not just technology, but this emotional connection. Yeah, we try and bring it down to its bare essence. And so we also like to think that our works are responsive more than interactive, because we don't like to make any demands of the viewer. And the work is responding. Why is that? We feel like it's artificial. Like if you see a flock of birds and you walk in their direction, they will naturally move away. You don't have to jump and scream and do that sort of thing. So we're really tapping into these natural uh, interactions. And we, yeah, I think we're just natural environment and natural interactions. And we feel like it becomes a bit artificial if you have mm. to do something to elicit a response, at least in the case of our works. Mm. And so we also try to keep the interaction as simple as possible because I think if it responds to each individual person and so on, it kind of takes away from the essence of what we're trying to get at. And mm. we're, we're really just trying to explore a behavior. And it's, it, it's, it's very... It's it like can behavioral be science rather than um, interaction. Yeah, because I think it kind of can go more into an area of entertainment if you start going in that direction. And so mm -hmm. we want to stay away from there because our work is already done if it responds in a very essential way. Well, we were discussing earlier this idea of almost a virtual reality and, and artists whom you admire and artists who are working within also the space of uh, robotics and animation and virtual reality. And that's also this idea of interaction, but within a very, almost like a false universe. So, I mean, you know, I th what was it? Uh, three years ago, we had this kind of incredible presentation here of Jordan Wolfson who's somebody we were just discussing, and, and the work is also this kind of incredible movement between that. Yeah, we, we really admire his work, and we often reference it when we're talking about lifelike, and his is extremely lifelike. And so you can you almost think that it's a human being. We're mm. working more in the area of caricature, 
and uh, sort of, yeah, almost like kind of holding a lens over a particular kind of subtle involuntary movement and trying to sort of amplify the emotional undertones. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing. We're also very interested in the, the physical world. So virtual reality is not something that we've explored yet. And we also don't start off looking at a technology. But perhaps where we, we have drawn from the screen is, you know, in the, in the late 90s, Soren's worked extensively with video games, and I was also doing a lot of simulations. And there you can have a lot of uh, lifelikeness and responsiveness, and you, it was a very low resolution format. So you had to create animation and empathy and build characteristics with a very small number of pixels. Usually it was only one. And so drawing that possibility out of the screen and sort of merging it with the here and now in the real world is something that has appealed to us. Mm. And so, do, I mean, do you, how, well, the idea of collaboration is also like hugely important. So this idea of reality, collaboration, and even your, your, the other half of Porson Rao. I, I asked a very indiscreet question finally after knowing Aparna for some time. I was like, so wait, tell me, are you also romantic partners of your of your work partner? And the answer was no. So your collaboration is very much almost as well this idea of he's at the studio in Bangalore. You are now back and forth between the laboratory and the studio. And so kind of maybe explain the way in, in which that can work. Yeah, we've been working together from like my early 20s. So, and it's very intense. So I almost feel like in some ways we're one person or one consciousness, so we're very different from each other. And uh, yes, we have our own partners. He just became a father, which is why he's not here. But I mean, just for, we, we mostly work quite well in sync and we only pursue ideas that both of us are really excited about. We don't disagree so much on the idea or uh, level of exploration. And you met in university. Yes. We were doing a master's in Italy, and we met there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for practical purposes, we sort of divide the work now because it's too overwhelming to do everything together. So he typically tends to look after the software aspects, and I'm looking at the mechanical and the manufacturing aspects. Yeah. And so, have you almost like had your own uh, education as, as a scientist? I mean, you you must have a kind of incredible uh, vocabulary in terms of uh, behavior patterns, you know, static motions, robotics. I mean, it's like almost a university degree in itself. No, no, no. Well, we're quite far from, yeah, <laughs> from being engineers. But yeah, we do have a sense for animation somehow. And I think it helps not to have a formal education because you can work much more with your intuition and with your senses and you can hear sounds which some engineers don't hear or see because we're, we're really using a different entrance mm -hmm. into technology. And so this idea of behavior and this like almost a fight or flight, I think, is in, in many ways. That's right. Yeah. Uh, is, is that something that you think is like the overarching theme to also in the different aspects of even animation, the robotics, the ways in which you infuse that into your works, because it's also kind of fun and playful. Yeah, we're, like I said earlier, we're really interested in psychology and human behavior and these sort of um, uh, interpersonal dynamics. And mm -hmm. sometimes we think that we're so caught in our own patterns of behavior that we believe that we're working out of free will and conscious choice but we have some defining motives or patterns that are really driving our lives and almost like algorithms. And so we find it quite comical that we are actually quite close to, much closer to robots than we think we are. And so when we look at our own life, especially- Automatons the, just <laughs> showing up. <laughs> yeah, something like that. And when we look at our own lives through this lens, we often see or discuss between ourselves how these patterns get solidified. And so a lot of the work is also very much about the body. So as much as it's about artificiality or robotics, it's also very much about the physical self. You know, this a, a, approaching something and then it reacting to you as a human being. Um, and I remember you did a work that was very, was very clearly about the body and erasing almost the human being yes. from it. Yes. 
So tell us maybe a little bit about that. Do we have the yeah, video? Yeah. Okay. Let me just go quickly forward to that work. Sorry to go out of sync. That's no what problem. happens at these talks. Yeah, this work was called A Missing Person. And um, yeah, we had a few motivations. We were, I think it was just sort of an idea of wanting to have this superhero kind of experience of invis you know, experiencing invisibility, but um, also being quite shy and wanting to like literally disappear from awkward social situations or painful circumstances in life. And so we worked with a company in India that was specializing in surveillance of uh, CCTV camera and technologies. And we got them to develop a system for us, which had a camera that could look into the room. It could identify people in the room and render one person invisible, no matter where they went in the room. So on the left, you'll see that Soren is present. And on the right, you'll see that he's been erased. It's very difficult to document this work. So this is an early prototype. So you see that the camera is following him and trying to erase him well. There were some technical issues with the overlap, but we managed to resolve that in the final artwork. Uh, which we put out like this. So there was a room with four walls, and on each of the four walls there was a small tiny screen, and people would enter into the room and they would gravitate towards these screens and they would see themselves, but one person would remain absent. So this was also about, there's a, like for a split second, there's, you kind of, your brain, brain does a kind of flip because of the cognitive dissonance, but you also really kind of wonder where you are, and you kind, it's about, also how much our virtual or screen presence affects our sense of self. And this work also reminded us of the social contract you have in India between uh, employees and their domestic staff. It's quite a complex and strange and also funny thing that they ignore each other. And when we showed this work in Being Japan, present yet yes. completely ignored or you know, almost as an object of furniture in many ways. And, all, and, and not necessarily in a disrespectful way. It's yeah, it's just something that maybe both parties feel quite comfortable with. Mm -hmm. it, it was much stronger when I was a child. Now it's changing and there's, it's much more of a casual relationship. Mm -hmm. And when we exhibited this work in Japan, we were quite surprised that people found it quite sinister because they associated it with a social disorder in Japan called hikikomori, where people feel isolated from society and can lock themselves up in a room for a very long time, several years. So it's explain to me then maybe this idea of how you almost inject also the idea of personal and the ideas of, you know, your identity really within this. I mean, it's like, I think one of the first times I've really heard you also then talk about the ways in which your kind of you know, youth or growing up then infuses yourself into this because I mean, you're not working in traditional painting or you know Indian miniatures or you know uh, this idea of what one would think of as something traditional from your culture. Um, so how how do you balance that with the very scientific aspects of what you do? I mean, we're really working from our own personal experience. So everything that we work with is sort of a response to something that we've observed in our personal lives. And also working with technology, it's, it's just a tool that's around now. It's just very hard to personalize, but it seems very natural for us to work with physical movement. Mm -hmm. So let me just quickly show you another work that is very personal. Um, yeah, and it's uh, this work, which is an early work, and it's called The Uncle Phone. And I really felt like I was an involuntary part of uh, a pattern that my uncle was caught in. And that was, you know, ever since I was a child, constantly asking me to do things for him, if it was like to turn on the lights, which bring him his socks, tell him what time it is, and so on. And it's quite common in India. And I, I, I felt... You were his bit, helper. <laughs> yeah, extension of his body, actually. And so um, I felt very frustrated, but didn't have a way of sort of addressing these mini interactions. And um, I felt the need to resolve it somehow. And so the situation that mystified me the most was the use of a landline telephone. He would hold on to the receiver and expect me to dial the number for him. And so in response, I made him this uh, long red telephone. It's so long that it requires two people to use it. Does it actually work? It does, it does. And that's really the easiest thing really with this phone and yeah so I was quite satisfied with the way that this work turned out because I thought it 
kind of capture a complexity that I'd found hard to put into words and the obvious affection that I felt for him and the distance and yeah, just the nature of our relationship. So the idea of performance is also quite important and we haven't discussed that yet, so I'm sorry if I am putting you on the spot, but I mean the idea of, of really interacting with an audience and not just creating these interactive works that are very much about the self and involuntary movement and a viewer, but also, you know, so much of what we've seen at Documenta and in Venice and, and uh, is really with the idea of performance involving itself uh, within the interaction of the art community, the viewer, and performance as art. So, I mean, for instance, have you uh, seen that, you know, of course you've seen the Tino Segal works at Palais de Tokyo or, you know, the Guggenheim. And, I mean, do, does that also influence the way in which you work? No, not, not really, no. No? Yeah, but we, we think about this sort of the role of the observer, and usually it's just an answer. So rather thing. than the role of a participant. Exactly, yeah. So I, I can just show you a work to illustrate that point. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's called the Imperial Monochromes, and it's the idea of these um, huge panels uh, which are on the wall. And this is sort of looking at the, the idea of the unsuspecting observer is completely innocent who walks into the room and does not realize that it's being, uh, he or she is being observed by the panels who will immediately panic and fall into a strict symmetry. And if the viewer continues to remain in the room relatively motionless, they will again sort of tend towards a chaotic or disorderly state until there is a sharp movement perceived in the room, and they will again fall into a strict order. So um, this work was actually came out of a, uh, had some resonance in a personal context, because I'd employed a, an intern at some point, and every time I passed by on the way out, I might be even talking on my phone, he would like jump out in fright and stand to attention almost to sort of acknowledge authority. So he was transferring a preconditioned behavior, but it, kind of cast me in the role of a tyrant, and I didn't appreciate that, but yeah, we got over it. So most of the works come from quite a personal space and is a reflection of things that are happening, and humor is part of it. We don't think about how can we make this more playful or funny. It's hard to break down comedy like that, but it just seems integrated in the way we look at things. And so, the idea of creating a finished artwork as opposed to uh, a gimmick, almost in a way, or you know, just like exploring science. Uh, I, I remember working with Mariko Mori years ago, and her work was also very much involved with this idea of you know celestial sciences. Um, how do you know you're done? Like, how how do you know you're able to to show it? I mean, that's kind of simple. So we, we try and use as little technology as possible. So the moment we've hit something that rings home with as little as possible, we're done. Because it's too, it's too painful to do more. Yeah, but we're also going for something very, very specific. And um, what we, we do, and I, I think we've, we've gotten better at that, is to be able to distill these movements and behaviors really to quite a minimal way and having that much time with an artwork because we take so long to produce it is kind of a luxury because you have that much more time to resolve things and pay attention and really distill it to its bare essence. So anything that's not as bare essence doesn't feel finished. So we're really going for the least that we can do to exemplify this interaction or behavior. Yeah, so we're trying to do as little as possible. So while you're working in these labs, what else is happening happening alongside your work, like what's happening at the lab next door or the desk next door? Oh yeah, they're doing pretty awesome stuff. Um, some of the labs are working with regeneration of skin, skin tissue. So when we, we develop scars, we become, our, our bodies become quite immobile. And so they're developing ways of having skin grow and graft more. don't work with really any organic, uh, uh, any organic materials in your no, work? No, we're yeah. Not, yeah, we're not working in that way. Um, yeah, so there's all these like different ways of doing dialysis, for example, that's, that's less invasive and that where you can live a better life without going to hospital or a new kind of motor or a new kind of um, 
a drone that can work a bit like a helicopter and like an airplane. So we're really, I mean, it's a very exciting environment and we're the only artists in the lab. The others are making products. And so we somehow have this amazing privilege of being there and making whatever we want. It, speaking of making products, is there ever a desire to make something that has just like an innate functionality? Um, no, not really. But um, we're now, I mean, we call this platform Pathos, that we're building certain tools and modules in the lab. And that is specifically for physical animation. And you know that delivers a high degree of nuance and personal expression, because that's very difficult to do. Robotics is not accessible for an individual. And so we're hoping to make this platform that will make it easy for us or anybody else who's non-technical to be able to work with this physical language of movement, which is really exciting and rich, but is currently not uh, accessible at all. So we really hope. So that, that could be a product. But we're, we're quite selfish in the sense we wanted to work for us because we've struggled for 15 years and we really know, you know how to break it down or we, we think we know. But we hope that it can be open source and that everybody else can use it as well. And then again, say your virtual reality is also something that's also very much about the interaction of the viewer with these headsets. And I mean, we were just at Art Basel in Hong Kong in March and one of a very popular uh, kind of part of the fair was uh, a, a kind of a collaboration with Google um, that were these virtual reality headsets and experiences. Is that something that you see, you know, I mean, again, that's the idea of being an, a, a participant rather than, a, and than an observer, but that technology must be relevant for the work you do. No, no, because no. we, no. See, clearly I'm not a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> no, because uh, one of the things that we really want to do is make technology disappear. So as soon as we see a lot of technology and that removes you from your present environment, because virtual reality takes you somewhere else. But we are very kind of attached to the here and now in this physical environment. So at the moment, it's not anything that seems very attractive for us. We're trying to do the opposite, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, on that note, uh, if we have any questions from the audience, we have another five minutes or so, so please feel free to raise your hands and ask us lots of questions. Um, well, ask Aparna lots of questions, not me. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, Sorry, there you have a microphone just here. Um, you don't use a lot of color, and is there a reason you think that detracts um, uh, from either the movement or detracts from the impression? I think what we're trying to do is... Um, well, she just said they're trying to make everything disappear, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's also trying to express everything you can purely through movement. And we feel like adding color will give it another interpretation or help it interpret the movement in a different way. And we're really trying to focus purely on movement. So unless it really rings true, like the red phone, there was it really enhanced the object and somehow integrated well. We don't play with color, though we'd love to. We, re we really hope we can have a reason to work with color. We're waiting for that. Hasn't happened yet. The idea of the red phone is so evocative also. And that's actually probably one of the only works we've seen that's actually properly functional. As you said, it as works an as an object. Yes, yes. Yeah. Maybe can we see the disappearing sun? Yes. This is one of my, my favorites. Yeah, this is a work that sort of implies a body. And it's the idea of a two-dimensional object, almost like a piece of paper that's left behind in the space. And when you walk past, it appears to sort of hopelessly struggle and climb up the wall, but it collapses every time. So in this case also, we think we've given it a body and an algorithm a mind, but it's generating its movements in real time. So how does this work? Is it, is it battery operated? Is it? No, no, this, this has a cable, and we've managed to conceal it behind the wall. But uh, yeah, it was very important that it, it seems two-dimensional. Well, yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's it's. It's yes. really functioning on electricity and... Yes. But now, we made this some time ago, but now you can get also technology and actuators that are really flat, 
And so we're hoping to upgrade this. Exactly. I was just about to say, so how, I mean, your work then is really almost living in the sense that you may have finished it, finished it at one point, but you can revisit it in a couple of years' time and really rework the cables, the technology, the other aspects. Is that something that you're open to or you think it should just live statically? Yeah, so far we've, we find it hard to let go of our work. And we've, so we're all constantly going back and trying, we can't help ourselves in trying to upgrade or improve. But having said that, we always work with the best quality components that are used in aeronautical or medical industry. Right. Yeah. And they're also assured of having new versions of them for the next 20 years, so that's a given. Mm -hmm. So that's the quality of components you need to work with if you want longevity and long life and robustness for your artworks. So it's working with what the best that you have at that given time, but then really being able to evolve with it. Yes, most of the components come with a guarantee of being upgradable. Very interesting. So what's the next project? Um, a man to the we moon. Have, yeah. <laughs> because these projects take so long to develop, we're usually developing 10 or 12 at different stages um, at the same time. Yeah, so we, we have a lot, lot of different projects. You also really enjoy this interaction with um, almost your audience. I mean, you're, you've done two TED Talks and you write a great deal. And Aparna and I were introduced uh, from Hans Lorik Overs, the kind of great introducer of all time. So, I mean, you also are very interested in these conversations and these ongoing um, interactions with artists and curators and the public. No, that's not true, actually. I find it quite difficult. But you, I... but you forced yourself <laughs> to do it. No, I, I think there's a larger, if I see that there's a larger goal and, you know, it's really about showing the work and people are really interested, but you see a lot of the work is about hiding and disappearing and that's really coming from a personal space. So I am shy, but then of course you, you, you need to get over it and if you... How did you prepare yourself for TED Talk? It was really hard because the time before I did TED, uh, it was at high school and I was elected the head girl and I couldn't do the acceptance speech. So, yeah, I think you grow up and you, you just learn how to deal with things. And you, if you have to do it, you have to do it. There you go. And we made her do this, clearly. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Please, everyone, uh, pour some around. One half right here. Thank you.